When you imagine the first Europeans Māori ever saw, you probably imagine people like James Cook, explorers on official missions dressed in fancy naval uniforms. But actually, for most Māori, first contact didn't look anything like that. The first Pākehā most Māori saw would have had sunburned and wind-scorched faces. Their clothes would have been crusted with salt and sometimes stained with blood. If you saw them today, you might assume they were victims of a shipwreck. That might have been what some Māori thought too. But these guys weren't castaways, and they weren't explorers or colonists either. They also weren't all Europeans. They came from all kinds of places. Asia, the Pacific Islands, America and Australia. And they came to Aotearoa to hunt the seals and whales which swarmed around our coasts. At first there were only a handful, but by the early 1800s whalers and sealers were arriving in their hundreds. They brought new technology, new diseases and new knowledge of the outside world. It was a revolutionary moment in New Zealand history. Whaling in particular was a driving force behind the musket wars, the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi and the colonisation of Aotearoa. Seals and whales played vital roles in our history long before the first non-Māori people turned up. Māori have a lot of stories about whales, like Paikia, who was rescued by a whale when his brother tried to drown him and travelled to Aotearoa on its back. It's thought one of the ways some of our tipuna discovered these islands was by following migrating whales. There's no evidence Māori hunted whales before Europeans turned up, but they did harvest the meat, teeth and bones of stranded animals. Whalebone was used to make weapons and jewellery. Reiputa, pendants made from the teeth of sperm whales, were especially and still are really prized. Many hapu still harvest stranded whales today. Seals were a different story. People all over the world had relied on seals for food and clothing for thousands of years. And the ancestors of Māori were no different. Archaeological material from hunting sites suggests that elephant seals and sea lions were hunted in such numbers by early Māori that they became extinct on the mainland. And it wasn't just those larger species. Before humans arrived in these islands, about 750 years ago, it's estimated there were up to 3 million fur seals living around Aotearoa. About 500 years later, when Europeans showed up, there were roughly 1.8 million, about a 40% reduction. And then, within 50 years of European contact, New Zealand's fur seal population collapsed to just 10,000 animals. That's about 0.3% of the pre-human population. The first European seal hunters were probably James Cook and his crew. Cook wrote quite a lot about hunting fur seals, especially while anchored in dusky sound, Tamatia, in the southwest of the South Island, during his second voyage to Aotearoa in 1773. We saw many seals, 14 of which we killed and brought away with us, and might have got many more, would the surf have permitted us to land with safety. The skins we made use of for our rigging, the fat gave oil for our lamps, and the flesh we ate. When Cook's journals were published back in the UK, his descriptions of fur seal colonies got a lot of attention. Fur seals, as you might have guessed, are furry, like William. Yeah, but unlike me, they have a dense undercoat protected by long guard hairs, which act kind of like a natural wetsuit. Moriori and some southern Māori wore waterproof seal skin clothing to stay warm and dry in bad weather. In the mid-18th century, the Chinese invented a method of separating the guard hairs from the soft underfur, which was highly valued for clothing. James Cook reported seal skins could be sold in Chinese ports for astonishing profits. This triggered a kind of gold rush for seal skins in the Pacific. And it only got more intense when the British invented their own method of processing seal skins in 1796 to make shoes and hats. By the 1830s, an estimated 7 million skins had been sent to England and China from the Southern Hemisphere, and at least 20% of those skins came from New Zealand. The first commercial sealing voyage to Aotearoa happened in 1792. 
A ship called the Britannia delivered a load of convicts to New South Wales, then crossed the Tasman to drop a gang of 11 sailors in Tamatea, or Dusky Sound. While they got stuck into the job of hunting seals, they also spent a fair bit of their time building a new ship to sail back to Australia, just in case the Britannia never returned to pick them up. That might seem like an overreaction. I mean, the Britannia did return 10 months later, but the fact is, sailors often did end up stranded when their ship sank or abandoned them. In 1813, a ship called Perseverance discovered five sealers living on Solander Island in the middle of Fovo Strait. They'd apparently been stranded there for four and a half years. A Sydney newspaper reported, they were clothed in seal skins, of which their bedding also was composed, and their food had been entirely made up from the flesh of the seal, a few fish occasionally caught, and a few seabirds that now and then frequent the island. The Britannia expedition was a bit of a false start for sealing in Aotearoa. They only caught 4,500 seals, which was seen as a poor return on investment. But the trade soon took off. Between 1804 and 1809, about 1.5 million seal skins were taken from our shores, mostly by ships operating out of Sydney. But, as historian Rhys Richards explains, we don't have many written records of how and where this happened. Captains tried hard to ensure that on their return to New South Wales, each newly discovered sealing ground or rookery would be a most carefully guarded secret, not to be divulged to other sealing gangs. There are few eyewitness accounts by sealers, for few sealers were educated, and no romance was attached at the time to their hard and often brutal trade. And it really was hard and brutal work. Sealers would navigate their boats up to the jagged rocks and heaving surf, then clamber all over them, chasing seals. They worked in all weather and often at night. Many men drowned or broke bones. When they weren't working, they lived in caves under upturned boats or in rudimentary huts, sometimes for months at a time. Plus, killing thousands of seals was a pretty gruesome job. And sometimes the seals fought back. Male fur seals grow to 180 kilograms, and they bite. Sealers also hunted elephant seals, and those can weigh more than two tons. Back in the year 2000, this big guy made international headlines after smashing up a bunch of cars on a boat ramp in Gisborne. The French scientist, Jules de Blosseville, visited the Bay of Islands in 1824 and spoke to sealers. He wrote, how powerful must be the love of money when it can induce men to support the fatigues and privations which fall to the lot of the seal fishers. Although they didn't always have much of a choice, many sealers were current or former convicts who had little say in where they were sent to work. Some were actually stowaways who jumped aboard sealing ships to escape convict settlements. Sealers mostly operated in remote areas, but many came into contact with Māori. There are several records of sealers trading for food and dressed flax with hapū in southern parts of the Waipounamu, the South Island, and Rakura, Stewart Island. In 1814, six Indian sealers deserted from a ship called the Matilda. Several of those men were killed by Māori, but 30 years later, it was reported one of them was living with southern Ngaitahu, and had received a facial moko. During the early 19th century, dozens of sealers, whalers, traders and escaped convicts joined Māori communities. These men often married Māori women and joined their wife's hapū, becoming what we call Pākehā Māori. Some Pākehā Māori were considered little more than slaves or curiosities, possessions in either case. But others, like Barnett Burns, were given chiefly status and wore mata'ora, full facial moko. Pākehā Māori were extremely useful to their hapū. They could act as translators and opened up opportunities for trade with other non-Māori arrivals. But relations weren't always harmonious. Between 1810 and 1821, there were a series of violent conflicts between sealers and southern Ngaitahu that some referred to as the Sealers' War. Possibly 74 people were killed, and a Ngaitahu settlement near modern-day Dunedin was burned to the ground. Some sources suggest this violence was triggered by the mistreatment of Māori women, or by theft from one side or the other, but the details are unclear. There were other downsides to contact with sealers. The destruction of seal colonies deprived Māori and Moriori of a traditional source of food and clothing. There were only ever a handful of sealers in Aotearoa at any one time in the early 1800s, but they had a massive impact. 
earlier visits from European explorers had been extremely brief, usually like a few days at most. Sealers, on the other hand, stuck around for months. Those who deserted sealing gangs to become Pākehā Māori might live among Māori for decades. This gave many southern hapū a chance to gain in-depth knowledge of European culture and technology. But the New Zealand sealing boom went bust within five years. After 1809, the market for seal skins collapsed, although it was revived later on in the 19th century. Meanwhile, in more northerly parts of Aotearoa, Māori were coming into contact with Pākehā hunting a different kind of sea mammal, the pārāua, or sperm whale. Unfortunately for these whales, they had a lot of valuable stuff inside them. Yeah, their heads were filled with an oily substance called spermaceti. It's thought this organ helps the whales eco-locate, but early whalers thought spermaceti looked a bit like semen. Which is how these animals got the name sperm whale. Real mature, guys. I prefer parawa. It might have looked gross, but spermaceti was useful. It could be processed into a lubricant for high-precision instruments or made into fancy candles, which burned without smoke. The intestines of sperm whales often contain a material called ambergris. Scientists think this is a side effect of swallowing the beaks of giant squid, but nobody's actually quite sure. Ambergris was, and still is, insanely valuable. It's used in the manufacture of perfumes and also as an aphrodisiac, because there's nothing sexier than congealed giant squid gunk. Indeed. But spermaceti and ambergris were just the icing on the cake. The bit which gave sperm whales the bulk of their value was blubber, the thick layer of fat which keeps whales and other marine mammals warm in cold oceans. Blubber was boiled up in big cauldrons called tripods and then refined down into a substance called whale oil. Whale oil was a good lubricant and could be burned in lamps. That was very helpful in the early 19th century because synthetic lubricants and electric lights hadn't been invented yet. In those days, whale oil lit millions of homes, businesses and public buildings. The factories of Britain and Europe would have ground to a halt without whale oil. It literally greased the gears of the Industrial Revolution. But to get all this valuable stuff, you first had to catch a whale. And that was pretty tricky. Yeah. The first kind of whalers in the Pacific were called ship or pelagic whalers, operating on large sailing vessels far out to sea. Men would climb way up to the top of the mast, scanning for the telltale spouts of whales breathing. When they spotted one, they'd shout down to the rest of the crew and the chase was on. When they got close, small boats would be launched. A man would lean over the side and spear the whale with a harpoon, attached to the boat with a long rope. Then the whale would take off dragging the whale boat behind it in what sailors called the Nantucket sleigh ride. Sounds kind of fun, but this was the most deadly part of the job. Lots of boats were destroyed and whalers killed. But if they were successful and all going well, the exhausted animal would be dragged alongside the ship. If it wasn't already dead, it would be killed with a long lance. Yeah, like this one. Next was the dirty and dangerous job of heating the blubber to release the oil. The tripods belched thick, greasy smoke, and burning oil sometimes set whole ships ablaze. By the late 1700s, more and more ship whalers were voyaging into the Pacific. The first recorded to reach Aotearoa was the famous British-American whaler Eber Bunker aboard William and Anne, which had transported convicts to New South Wales. He anchored in Doubtless Bay in 1791. Visits became increasingly common in the early 1800s as wealthy ship-owning merchants set up shop in New South Wales and Tasmania. Increasing numbers of whalers made contact with Māori communities, trading for supplies and recruiting locals as sailors. Fun fact, the famous whaling novel Moby Dick has a major character called Kwekwek. That guy is thought to be based on Te Pehi Kupe, a Ngāti Tuarangatira who jumped aboard a British ship in 1824 and sailed with it back to England. As with sealing gangs, whaling ship crews were incredibly diverse. Along with Europeans and Māori, there were Pacific Islanders, African and Native Americans, Aboriginal Australians, Chinese people. More than a few women went to sea as well. Whaling was a truly global industry, and it transformed the Pacific. New Zealand, along with places like Australia, Samoa, Fiji, Tahiti and Hawaii, were major hubs for the trade. Settlements like Hobart, Kororarika, Apia and Honolulu exploded into 
bustling ports where people from all over the world gathered. Imperial powers like Britain, Germany, France and the United States were all keen to grab a slice of the growing Pacific whale trade. And conflicts between these powers had a big impact on the industry. Surprise, surprise. For example, part of the reason British whaling dramatically increased in the Pacific at the start of the 19th century is because of the Napoleonic War. French warships were attacking British whalers in the Atlantic, so they came to the Pacific instead. Then the 1810s saw a downturn in British whalers as the Brits and Americans started fighting the War of 1812. From the 1830s, the Pacific whaling trade became dominated by ships sailing out of Massachusetts in the United States. By that point, there were a lot of whalers sailing around the coasts of Aotearoa. Historian Alexander McClintock estimated that by 1839, about 200 whaling ships were passing through our waters every year. Partly that was because of a sailor called Jackie Gard, who reported seeing a bunch of whales near to shore in the Moana Orokoa, Cook Strait, in either 1827 or 1829. As historian Alfred Reed put it, it was a lucky day for Gard, but a very unlucky day for the whales. Indeed. The whales Jackie Gard saw were Tohoraha, southern right whales. And the reason they were called right whales is because they were the right whale to hunt. Sperm whales might have had cool stuff like ambergris and spermaceti inside them, but they were hard to catch. They were fast swimmers and mostly lived far out to sea. Right whales, on the other hand, were pretty slow and gathered in sheltered bays to raise their calves. They also tended to float after they were killed. Most other whales sank. That made right whales easy targets, not just for ship whalers, but for so-called shore whalers too. These shore whalers hunted using large boats they rowed out from shore. German scientist Ernst Diefenbach watched shore whalers at work in the Bay of Islands in 1839 and gave this fairly graphic description. Gasping in the agonies of death, the tortured animal throws up jets of blood, dying the sea all around, beating about with its tail, but at length dies, exhausted from the many wounds inflicted. Gnarly. Then the dead whale had to be hauled back to a whaling station to do the processing that other whalers did on board ships. These stations weren't exactly pleasant places. Historian Brad Patterson describes your average whaling station as a huge open-air slaughterhouse. The beach was covered with the remains of whales, skulls, vertebrae, large shoulder blades and fins. The sands were stained with blood and fat. Chunks of rotting flesh lay about. The small complex was overhung with clouds of oily black smoke. The stench was intense. But while it was messy, to say the least, shore whaling was also extremely profitable and extremely popular. In 1841, Henry Peter wrote that there was scarcely a harbour in Cook Strait and on the eastern coast of the southern island in which there are not whaling establishments. Some historians today think that was a bit of an exaggeration, but in any case, there were a lot. And they were only possible thanks to close collaboration with local Māori, who provided food, firewood and labour. Almost all shore whaling stations employed Māori crew on their boats, men and women. As historian Ryan Tucker-Jones writes, by the 1840s, at least Māori women were even leaping off whaleboats into the ocean to spare small porpoises by hand. Unlike sailors or ship whalers, shore whalers didn't just periodically trade with Māori. They set up permanent or at least long-term settlements, often within or next door to kāinga Māori, which required a whole lot of mutual trust and cooperation. Contact with shore whalers had an especially big impact in Te Waipaunamu. In 1844, it was estimated two-thirds of Ngaitahu women between Horomaka, Banks Peninsula, and Aparima, Riverton, were married to whalers. Similar levels of interracial marriage probably weren't seen in the North Island until a hundred years later. Mm, the names of Pākehā whalers still live on in many Ngaitahu Fano, Anglem, Gilroy, Spencer, Haberfield, Acker and Howe, to name just a few. The popo on Bluffs Te Rau Aroha Marae depict these marriages and the children born from them. Many Māori communities look back fondly to this pre-colonial whaling era, compared to the battle for sovereignty and land that defined the colonial frontier later on. Some Māori communities continued shore whaling into the 20th century, long after most whaling stations had closed. 
but contact with whalers could be harmful for Māori. For one thing, they often introduced new diseases. In 1835, Ngaitahu suffered a deadly outbreak of measles, followed by a devastating influenza epidemic, both of which killed large numbers of people, particularly around Forvo Strait and at Otako. Interactions could also be violent. In 1809, the trading ship Boyd anchored in Whangaroa Harbour to pick up some timber spars from Ngati Uru. But then, Ngati Uru found out the Boyd's captain had flogged and starved a young rangatira who'd sailed with the ship from Sydney. They attacked and killed most of the Boyd's crew, about 70 people. Later, the ship's gunpowder store was accidentally ignited, setting off a massive explosion which killed several Māori and destroyed the ship. A group of whalers mistakenly thought the Ngāpuhi chief, Te Pahi, was to blame. So, in March 1810, the crews of five whaling ships attacked Te Pahi's pa on an island in Wairua Bay. Up to 60 people were killed and the pa was destroyed. That event triggered a wider war among Māori in the area. The Bahi was killed in the fighting, and visits from European ships reduced dramatically for a few years because of fears of conflict. Whaling was also closely linked to the musket wars. Visiting ships often traded muskets and ammunition for food and other supplies. And whaling ships sometimes carried Māori war parties to attack enemies or conquer territory. One of the main reasons Ngāti Toa Rangatira seized control of Kāpiti Island in 1824 is because Te Pehi Kupe and Te Rauparaha knew it was an excellent location for whaling ships to visit. Controlling the island meant better access to muskets and other valuable trade goods. But by the late 1830s, some Māori were getting increasingly concerned about the negative impacts of whalers. Kororareka, later renamed Russell, was a major hub for the trade, and it became infamous for drunkenness, fights and prostitution. A missionary called William Kalenzo said Kororareka was notorious for containing a greater number of rogues than any other spot of equal size in the universe. Concern about these rowdy sailors was a major factor in the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. Māori and missionaries both hoped the new British governor would help control Pākehā in places like Kororarika. After the treaty was signed in 1840, far fewer whaling ships visited our shores, although that's mostly because of new taxes and port duties introduced by Governor William Hobson. But by the 1850s, the entire Pacific whaling industry was collapsing. Hunting was so intense that right whales and sperm whales were nearing extinction. One side effect of this was that a lot of ship captains in the Pacific suddenly had to find new work. Many became traders. Historian Scott Hamilton suggests former American whalers played an important role selling guns and ammunition to Māori during the New Zealand wars. Others entered a notorious trade known as blackbirding, where thousands of indentured or enslaved Pacific Islanders and Aboriginal Australians were transported to work in places like Queensland, Vanuatu and Peru. Some victims of blackbirding were brought to New Zealand, and some local ship captains participated in the trade, although it's not clear how many. But while many whalers had to switch professions in the 1850s and 60s, commercial whaling didn't actually end for another 100 years. New technologies like steam engines and harpoon guns made it profitable to hunt species like the humpback and blue whales, which were often too fast or aggressive for whalers on sailing ships. At Whangamumu, south of the Bay of Islands, a pair of brothers used steel nets and a steam-powered launch to hunt humpback whales. By 1915, they were catching 70 animals a year. Another whaling station at Tory Channel was even more successful, taking up to 200 whales a year in the early 1960s. But eventually, there just weren't enough whales left to support the industry, especially given that demand for whale oil fell dramatically in the 20th century, thanks to the invention of synthetic lubricants and electric lights. In 1964, commercial whaling in the waters of Aotearoa finally ended, although it wouldn't be outlawed until the 1970s. By that point, there was a big global anti-whaling protest movement. But you might be surprised to know the first efforts at conserving whales didn't have anything to do with public protest. They came from the industry itself. New Zealand was a founding member of the International Whaling Commission in 1946. The commission enforced moratoriums and catch limits. These were aimed at allowing populations to recover so that whaling could continue, but on a sustainable basis. But in the 1970s, public attitudes changed in many parts of the Western world. 
thanks to technology like underwater cameras and microphones, people could now see and hear marine mammals in their natural environment. Whales and dolphins were increasingly understood as intelligent, emotionally complex animals. They became symbols of the rising environmental movement. Activist organisations like Greenpeace and Sea Shepherd took direct action to protest whaling, including in Aotearoa. As a country, New Zealand became a leader of the anti-whaling movement. All around the world, protections on whales and seals steadily increased. In 1978, Aotearoa passed the Marine Mammals Protection Act. It became illegal to kill dolphins, seals or whales in our waters. But it was almost too late, especially for the Tohoraha, southern right whale. It's estimated the local population crashed from 10,000 before 1800 to just 250 in the 1990s. Pody. But the good news is that while some species, like Maui's dolphin, are still threatened with extinction, most whale and seal populations are recovering. The Department of Conservation estimates tohoraha numbers are increasing by 7% a year. And with the recovery of these species, some people, including here in New Zealand, have argued in favour of a return to commercial whaling and sealing, but this time sustainably. Looking back over the last 230 years, it's amazing to think how much of our national story is caught up in the history of these animals. Yeah, as historian Ryan Tucker-Jones put it, whales are the silent players at the centre of many historical dramas. They swim through the histories of capitalism, science, diplomacy, Euro-American imperialism, the Pacific, indigenous revival, and the modern environmentalist movement. And that's all from us this episode. Noho ora mai.